Well, happy Sabbath to everyone. Hope everyone's having a wonderful Sabbath day. It, today's a little bit of a special day since it is the day before Pentecost. It's a nice, long, uh, double Sabbath weekend. It is indeed such a blessing to be able to enjoy the Sabbath, to have this recur every seven days. It truly is a great blessing. I'd like to start off, as I always do, to give a wonderful shout out to three special people, to Nancy Miller, to Daisy Swint, to Gene Ward. Hope all of you are having a wonderful Sabbath. Also, a uh, shout out to Bruce Metzger and Teresa and Jonathan down in Monterey. And now Guillermo, uh, welcome to uh, services. Brethren, we live in a world today that values and demands instant gratification. In generations past, people would save up in order to buy things. At, you know, after saving up the needed amount, they would buy the item outright, and they'd own it outright. There was very little revolving debt. If you wanted something, you would have to save up for it, anticipating how nice it would be to actually have the item, and then you'd go and buy it when you had the money. No debt, no lingering payments. You know, all that changed with the advent of easy credit. Easy purchases and easy debt. Well, the easy part is getting in debt. The hard part is getting out of debt. So now if the consumer wants something, even on a whim for something he really doesn't need, he can impulsively purchase that item on credit and instantly have it. Instant gratification. And then the reality hits that after the newness of the item has worn off and that instant gratification has been satisfied, the debt for that item still remains. From CNBC, the average family, American family, carries $6,194 in credit card debt. Revolving debt that never goes away because as the debt is paid down, new purchases are put on the card and the new debt is added right back on to the card. It never goes away. Instant gratification is a characteristic of an ungodly society that the Apostle Paul described in 2 Timothy, 1, 2 Timothy 2 and verse 1, where he wrote, This also know that in the last days perilous times should, shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves. That's instant gratification, is self-love. It's what you want, and you want it right now. Along with instant gratification that the world treasures and demands in this society today comes a corresponding decrease in godly qualities, like patience, love for others, self-control, and endurance. Please turn with me to Mark chapter 13. Mark chapter 13. Jesus was telling his disciples concerning the future persecutions of his followers, the saints, the called out one, the called out men and women whom God the Father would call throughout the centuries until the end, until the time of the end. Mark 13, and we'll read verse 13. Christ said, And you shall be hated of all men for my name's sake, but he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. So, brethren, Jesus proclaimed that his followers would all be hated by the world, by everyone, but that those of his followers who endured unto the end would be saved. An important part of this scripture is enduring unto the end. And brethren, in my sermon this afternoon entitled, Will You Endure Unto the End? I would like to explore the subject of endurance and give you five points in helping you in to endure unto the end. But first, as always, we must define our terms. So what is endurance? The English verb endure in Mark 13, verse 13, is the Greek verb hupomeno. H-U-P-O-M-E-N-O. -E it's Strong's number 5272. According to the HELPS Words Studies, 
It means to remain under, as in remaining under a load or bearing up. Strong's Concordance states that the verb means to stay behind, to await, to endure, to persevere. So the connotation from the Greek is to endure while you're waiting for something. So the connotation of Mark 13, verse 13 in the Greek is that those who endure while waiting for something shall be saved. And that something that we're all waiting for is the return of Jesus Christ and the first resurrection and entry into the kingdom. Please turn with me to 2 Timothy 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2. The verb hupomeno, H-U-P-O-M-E-N-O, appears 17 times in the New Testament. A few of these verses include 2 Timothy 2 and verse 7. We'll start in verse 7. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 7. Consider what I say, and the Lord give you understanding in all things. Remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel, wherein I suffer trouble as an evildoer, even unto bonds, but the word of God is not bound. Therefore I endure, hupomeno, all things for the elect's sake, that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Jesus Christ with eternal glory. It is a faithful saying, for if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. Now in verse 10, Paul writes that he is patiently enduring, patiently enduring all things in his life on account of or because of the elect. Brethren, are we that way? Do we endure all things for our fellow brethren? Do we love the brethren? Are we patient with the brethren? Or do we continually lose patience with them? How do we treat the brethren? Are we showing patient endurance? Please turn with me to James chapter 5. James writes about enduring hupomeno and puts it in the connotation of patience. James 5 and verse 10. James 5 and verse 10. Take, my brethren, the prophets who have spoken in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering, affliction, and of patience. Behold, we count them happy, which endure. Hupomeno. You have heard of the patience of Job, and have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. Hupomeno, patient endurance. Please turn with me to Romans 12. Paul again writes about endurance and perseverance in his epistle to the congregation in Rome. In Romans 12, we'll begin in verse 9. Romans 12 and verse 9. In Romans 12, starting in verse 9, Paul writes, Let love be without dissimulation. Abhor that which is evil, cleave to that which is good. Be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love, and honor preferring one another. Not slothful in business, fervent in prayer and spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient, hupomeno, in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer. Now in Romans 12 and verse 12 in the New American Standard Bible, it says, rejoicing in hope, persevering in tribulation, devoted to prayer. Now, the noun form of the Greek verb hupomeno is hupomene. It's H-U-P-O-M-E-N-E. -E. And it's Strong's 5281, which means patient, Endurance. One's a verb, hupomeno, and the other is a, is a noun, which is hupomene. So we can gather that endurance, or hupomene, is the patient perseverance that we show in the midst of hardship while we earnestly are waiting for something. Now that we've explored the biblical definition of endurance, let's begin our exploration concerning ways to help us to endure, to patiently persevere, 
to the end. In the midst of hardships, while we earnestly wait and prepare ourselves for the return of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now the first point in helping us to endure unto the end is point number one, do not be fearful. Do not be fearful. From the article, The Effects of Chronic Fear on a Person's Health, in the November 11, 2017 edition of the American Journal of Medical Care, we read, there are several, quote, there are several potential consequences of fear on overall physical, emotional, environmental, and spiritual health. The potential effects of chronic fear on overall health include immune system dysfunction, endocrine system dysfunction, autonomic nervous system alterations, sleep-wake cycle disruption, and eating disorders. The potential consequences of chronic fear on spiritual health include bitterness, fear toward God or others, confusion, disgust with God or religion, loss of trust in God and or the clergy, waiting for God to fix it, and despair related to perceived loss of spirituality." Unquote. This is from a journal of medical care written by people not in the church. Bitterness and fear toward God and others, and a lack of trust in God. In short, fear can take control of our lives if we let it. In his first inaugural address of his presidency on March the 4th, 1932, 1933, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt attempted to calm the fear and worries of a nation in the depths of the Great Depression with these following famous words. The only thing we have to fear is fear itself. You know, brethren, with God the Father and Jesus Christ helping us and fighting for us each and every day, these words should have even a more resounding meaning for us today as children of our Heavenly Father. Again and again, Yehovah emphasized to the Israelites that they should not fear because he would be with them again and again. Please turn with me to Deuteronomy 1. Deuteronomy chapter 1. You know, after 40 years of wandering in the wilderness because of their unbelief and their rebellion against Jehovah, the Israelites were back at the same point that they were 40 years earlier, ready to enter into the promised land. And what, was some of, what were some of the encouragements that, the, that God the Father gave to them? Deuteronomy 1 and verse 21. Behold, Yehovah your God has set the land before you. Go up and possess it. As Yehovah God of your fathers has said unto you, Fear not, neither be discouraged. Fear not. Again and again, he said this to the Israelites. Just as Yehovah had done 40 years earlier at this point, he told the Israelites not to fear, but to trust him. He continually told the Israelites not to fear whenever the Israelites faced danger or trouble or a problem. Please turn with me to Deuteronomy 31. Deuteronomy chapter 31. Moses was giving his final words and instructions to the Israelites before they entered into the promised land. And Moses would not be going with them, but Joshua would be leading them into the promised land. And Yehovah would be protecting them. And we read this in Deuteronomy 31, starting in verse 6. Deuteronomy 31 and verse 6. Be strong and of a good courage. Fear not, nor be afraid of them, for Yehovah your God, he is that he it is that does go with you. He shall not fail you, nor forsake you. And Moses called unto Joshua and said unto him in the sight of Israel, Be strong and of good courage, for you must go with this people into the land which Yehovah has sworn unto their fathers to give them. And you shall cause them to inherit it. And Yehovah, he it is that 
does go before you, and he will be with you. He will not fear, fail you, neither forsake you. He says this again and again, and he ends it saying, Fear not, neither be dismayed. Please turn with me to 1 Chronicles 28. In his final, discussion, his final instructions to Solomon before Solomon was made king, David encouraged his son not to have fear, but to trust his God, his Elohim, his mighty one, Yehovah. And we read this in 1 Chronicles 28 and verse 20. 1 Chronicles 28 and verse 20. We read, And David said to Solomon his son, Be strong and of good courage, and do it. Fear not, nor be dismayed. For Jehovah, your mighty one, even my mighty one, will be with you. He will not fail you, nor forsake you, until you have finished all the work for the service of the house of Jehovah. Please turn with me to Luke 5. Luke chapter 5. You know, this encouragement to the people with whom God the Father calls and works with continues throughout the Old Testament and into the New Testament. You know, at Jesus' calling of Peter, James, and John, the first recorded words of Jesus to them were, not, were to ha not have fear. We read this in Luke 5 and verse 10. The first words he had to them were these. And so was also James and John, the sons of Zebedee, which were partners with Simon. And Jesus said unto Simon, Fear not. Very first words. Fear not, from henceforth you shall catch men. <clears throat> Please turn with me to Luke 12. Jesus again comforts and instructs his disciples that they should not fear. Luke 12 and verse 4. It's just a theme throughout Jesus' ministry is to not have fear, but to trust the Father. Luke 12 and verse 4. <clears throat> Jesus said, And I say unto you, my friends, be not afraid of them that kill the body. After that, they have no more that they can do. But I will forewarn you that whom you shall fear. Fear him which, after he has killed, has power to cast into Gehenna. Yea, I say unto you, fear him. Are not five sparrows sold for two farthings, and not one of them is forgotten before God? And even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore. Fear not, therefore. You are, more, you are of more value than many sparrows. And later in his discourse, Jesus continues in verse 22. And he said unto his disciples, Therefore I say unto you, Take no thought for your life, what you shall eat, neither for the body, what you shall put on. The life is more than meat, and the body is more than raiment. Consider the ravens, for they neither sow nor reap, which neither have storehouse nor barn, and God feeds them. How much more are you better than the fowls? And which of you with taking thought can add to his stature one cubit? If you then be not able to do that thing which is least, why take you thought for the rest? Consider the lilies, how they grow. They toil not, they spin not, and yet I say unto you that Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. If then God so clothed the grass, which is today in the field and tomorrow is cast into the oven, how much more will he clothe you? O you of little faith, and seek not you which what you shall eat or what you shall drink, neither be you night of doubtful mind. For all these things do the nations of the world seek after, and your Father knows that you have need of these things. But rather seek you the kingdom of God, the kingdom of our heavenly Father, and all these things shall be added unto you. And he ends this discourse by saying, Fear not, little flock, 
For it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. The command, fear not, brethren, the command, fear not, appears 61 times in the Bible, always in relation to trusting our Heavenly Father, that He will always be with us, He will always take care of us, and He will always love us. So, brethren, it is important that we do not have fear of the future, that we don't have fear of the unknown, that we do not have fear of what might happen. Fear of what might happen is the opposite of trusting our Heavenly Father. We live in a very dangerous world, and it is scary sometimes, but we should not have fear. So not having fear, but instead trusting God the Father and Jesus Christ will help us endure unto the end. Brethren, the second point in helping us to endure unto the end is point number two, be confident. Point number two, be confident. Brethren, as called out saints of our Heavenly Father, do we exude confidence? Do we exude confidence in our lives? Confidence interwoven with humility is very, very powerful. It is a characteristic that is immediately recognized in business affairs and in personal relationships. Someone who knows and knows that he knows is a very confident person. Please turn with me to Philippians 4. Philippians chapter 4. The Apostle Paul wrote about this confidence based on humility to the greatness and power of God the Father and Jesus Christ. We read this in Philippians 4 and verse 10. Paul writes, But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly, and that now at the last your care of me has flourished again, wherein you were also careful, but you lacked opportunity. Not that, not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in what, whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. I know both how to be abased, and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. And then in verse 13, very famous verse, I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. Now, some Greek texts have the word Christ at the end of the verse, and some Greek texts don't. Many English translations, such as the New International Version, the English Standard Version, the New American Standard Version, the International Standard Version, the New English Translation Bible, the douay Reims Bible, the Darby Trans Bible Translation, and the English Revised Version all do not include the apparently added word. The Bible versions read, I can do all things in him who strengthens me. Well, who is the him in verse 13? In verse 10, Paul is referring to the Lord, which in the Greek text is simply kurios, without the word the, which we have previously explored in other sermons, is the title given to Yehovah in the Greek Septuagint. So as we previously explored in other sermons, that Yehovah is indeed God the Father. So the reference here in Philippians 4 is actually to God the Father. Basically, Paul is saying that we can do all things through the power given unto us by our Heavenly Father. Knowing that this is true, that we can do all things with the power that the Father gives to us, gives us great confidence to fight our battles, to conquer our fears, and to win our victories. Please turn with me to Matthew 19. The Apostle Paul was mirroring in Philippians 4 the very words of Jesus in Matthew 19. Jesus had just ended the conversation with the young rich man who decided not to follow Christ because of his riches. He did not want to give up his riches to follow him. In Matthew 19 and verse 23, we read, 
Then said Jesus unto his disciples, Verily I say unto you, that a rich man shall hardly enter into the kingdom of heaven. And again I say unto you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to go to enter into the kingdom of God. When his disciples heard it, they were exceedingly amazed, saying, well then, who can be saved? And verse 26, But Jesus beheld them and said unto them, With men this is impossible, but with God, with God the Father, all things are possible. In verse 26, Jesus is referring to God the Father. So Jesus was saying that with God the Father, all things are possible. Just like Paul said in Philippians 4. Knowing that should give us all confidence and strength and assurance in fighting our daily battles and struggles. Please turn with me to Colossians 1. The Apostle Paul gave encouragement to the Colossian congregation for them to be strengthened and to be confident and to have great endurance. In Colossians chapter 1 and verse 9, I'm going to read this out of the New International Version. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 9. Paul writes, We continually ask God, God the Father, to fill you with the knowledge of His will through all the wisdom and the understanding that the Spirit gives, so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord, that's Jesus Christ, and please Him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing the knowledge of God, God the Father, being strengthened with all power according to His glory, to His glorious might, so that you may have great endurance and patience. Here we are again with endurance and patience. To have confidence in the Father. Do we realize that growing in the knowledge of our Heavenly Father, growing in our relationship with Him, following the example of Jesus Christ that He left for all of us, being strengthened by the might of God the Father Himself will give us the endurance that we will need to defeat any enemy, to win any battle, to claim the crown that our Heavenly Father is offering to us. Brethren, is that a living truth in our lives? Is that a reality in our daily lives? Do we exude that confidence? In our lives. Paul sums it all up in one verse in Philippians 1. Please turn with me to Philippians 1. Paul is exhorting the Philippian brethren to have confidence that they will make it into the kingdom. Philippians chapter 1, and we'll begin in verse 3. Philippians chapter 1, beginning in verse 3. Paul writes, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you, all making request with joy, for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. And then in verse 6, being confident of this very thing that he which has begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. As we have explored in previous sermons from Romans 1, verse 8, Acts 24, and verse 14, Paul's God was God the Father, who is also Jehovah, the God of his fathers. So Paul is writing that we should be confident, we should have confidence that God the Father, having called and chosen us out of all these billions of people on the earth, and having begun his work in us, our Heavenly Father will perform that work until our physical deaths or until the first resurrection, when God the Father, through Jesus Christ, will resurrect us. Brethren, do we believe or do we doubt that God the Father will and can finish His work that He started in us when He called us out of the world? Do we truly believe that He will finish His work in us? Please turn with me to Psalm 37. 
David wrote about having confidence in our Heavenly Father in that Yehovah would not let us be utterly cast down even though we may fall. And we read this in Psalm 37, in verse, starting in verse 23. Psalm 37 and verse 23. The steps of a good man are ordered by Yehovah, God the Father. And he delights in his way. And though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down. For Yehovah, God the Father, upholds him with his hand. In verse 24, the words utterly cast down is a translation of the Hebrew verb Tul, T-U-L, it's Strong's 2904. This verb is in the Hophal form in the Hebrew, which means to be hurled headlong or to be totally, totally overwhelmed. David wrote that our Heavenly Father will uphold us in His hand and that we will never be totally overwhelmed in our problems and circumstances. Sometimes it feels like we are overwhelmed, but the Father will not let us be totally overwhelmed to the point that we fail. Please turn with me to 1 Corinthians 10. Do we ever feel that we are just overwhelmed by our trials or our problems, by our circumstances that just keep seeming to happen? Paul addresses this issue in his first epistle to the Corinthian church. Please turn with me to 1 Corinthians 10, and we'll read verse 13. And I'll read this in the New English Translation. 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 13. No trial has overtaken you that is not faced by others. And God, Hotheos, God the Father, is faithful. He will not let you be tried beyond what you are able to bear, but with the trial will also provide a way out so that you may be able to endure it. Brethren, does knowing that our Heavenly Father will not test us beyond our abilities to win the battle, to be victorious over that test, to achieve what He wants us to achieve, does that give us the confidence that we need to always trust Him and never doubt Him? And never doubt the situation that we're in. Verse 13 states that we are not having to face any trial, any tribulation, any test that others have not had to endure before us. <clears throat> Our predecessors have endured, and we will endure. God the Father does not want us to fail. He will never sabotage us. He will not sabotage us because He will not sabotage His plan of salvation, which includes each and every one of us. So, brethren, do we exude confidence in our lives? Do we confidently attack our problems each and every day with the confidence and assurance that no matter what may be happening, no matter what the seemingly overwhelming problem is in our lives, no matter how bleak and hopeless the situation may seem to be, we know that God the Father and Jesus Christ have our back. That they will not let us fall and not get back up. And that our Heavenly Father will never give us a test, never will give us a test that we cannot overcome. He is on our side, and He loves us very much. As Paul wrote in Romans 8 and verse 31, If God the Father be for us, who can be against us? Let that sink in. If God the Father is for us, who or what could be ever against us? This confidence, brethren, will help us to endure unto the end. The third point in helping to endure unto the end is point number three, be steadfast. Be steadfast. As we have heard in sermons for decades, the spiritual race we run is not a sprint. 
The race we run is a marathon. Running marathons takes a steadfast approach. Runners of long distances have to be steadfast in their training, in their preparations, and in their strategies for running the race. Unlike sprinters of the 100-meter dash, where runners just run full bore for just a few seconds and then it's over, marathon runners have to build muscle endurance, which will permit them to last the entire race. Just like these runners, we must take the same approach in our spiritual lives and the spiritual race that we are running. Please turn with me to Hebrews 12, and we'll read a very well-known verse. Hebrews 12 and verse 1. <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 1. We read, Wherefore, seeing we are all, we are comp compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, lay us aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the, set that is, the race that is set before us. Well, in, in verse 1, the Greek word for patience here, again, is our friend, hupomeno, or hupomene or patient endurance, hupomene, just as we've read before. The last part in verse 1, translated in the New Living Translation, is translated as, and let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. Please turn with me to 1 Corinthians 16. And we will read a very important verse that it's always had a very weird phrase from Old English and the King James Version. The Apostle Paul is exhorting the Corinthian brethren to be steadfast in their faith. 1 Corinthians 16 and verse 13, very short verse. And in the, in the King James it reads, Watch you, stand fast in the faith, quit you like men, be strong. Now, the Greek verb for stand firm in verse 13 is steko, S-T-E-K-O. It's Strong's 4739, which means to stand fast, to stand firm, and to persevere. All of these terms are all interwoven with one another. And the quit you like men is just be, be courageous. Be courageous. In 1 Corinthians 16 and verse 13, in the New International Version, we read, Be on your guard, stand firm in the faith, be courageous, be strong. Please turn with me to Philippians 1, where we will read another occurrence of the verb steko. Paul is exhorting the Philippian brethren to be steadfast in one spirit and not to be terrified by their trials and, and their enemies. <clears throat> we read this in Philippians 1 and verse 27. Philippians chapter 1 and verse 27. Paul writes, Only let your conversation be as it becomes the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs, that you stand fast, that's steko, S-T-E-K-O, in one spirit, with one mind striving together for the faith of the gospel, and in nothing terrified by your adversaries. Don't fear your adversaries. Don't be terrified by what's going on around you, which is to them an evident token of perdition, but to you of salvation and that of God, that of God the Father. Brethren, Paul is also speaking to us. We should stand fast in one spirit, in unity, and in one mind. And we should not be fearful of our adversaries. We shouldn't be terrified of our adversaries and of world events and things swirling all around us. Or any trouble that we may be facing. Please turn with me to James chapter 1. James chapter 1. This is a very hard scripture to apply because no one enjoys trials. No one enjoys hurt. No one enjoys 
tribulations, but we must experience them in order for us to grow spiritually. We read this in James 1 and verse 2. James chapter 1 and verse 2. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations or trials, knowing this, that the trying of your faith works patience, hupomene, patient endurance. But let patient endurance, let patience, hupomene, patient endurance, have her perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. In the English Standard Version, James 1 and verse 2 is translated, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Paul also writes concerning this spiritual maturing process in Romans 5. Please turn with me to Romans 5. Paul further explains this step-by-step process. We read this in Romans 5 and verse 3. Romans 5 and verse 3. Paul writes, And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation works patience, hupomene, patient endurance, and patience... Hupomene, patient endurance, experience, and experience hope. That's the process that Paul laid out. We read this same verse and verses in the New Living Translation as, We can rejoice too when we run into problems and trials, for we know that they help us develop endurance. And endurance develops strength of character, and character strengthens our confident hope of salvation. All of these terms are all intertwined and are dependent upon one another. Please turn with me to 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15. Paul discusses the first resurrection, which we are all striving to be part of. The first resurrection is our entry into our Heavenly Father's kingdom and into eternal life. Paul writes that because of this hope, the hope that we have, that the hope, the hope that the world doesn't have, we are to remain steadfast and unmovable. And we read this in 1 Corinthians 15. Very, very familiar verses. We'll probably be going over these verses tomorrow also. 1 Corinthians 15, starting in verse 50. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither does corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we sh- all shall be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, Then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O grave, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, God the Father, which gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And verse 58, Therefore, my brethren, This is the summation of all of this that we're looking forward to, the first resurrection. Therefore, my brethren, be you steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of Yehovah, of God the Father, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in God the Father. The Greek adjective for steadfast in verse 58 is edreos, E-D-R-A-I-O-S, E-D-R-A-I-O-S. It's Strong's number 1476, and it means solidly based, morally fixed, firm in purpose, steadfast, not given to fluctuation or moving off course. Brethren, do we live our lives in our spiritual life? 
in our spiritual race with edreos, with firmness and steadfastness of mind and heart, not given to fluctuating, uh, fluctuations and not moving off course, but staying the course when we run our race. This type of steadfastness will help us endure until the end. The fourth point in helping to endure until the end is point number four, do not become weary and give up. Do not become weary and give up. Again, brethren, we live in a society that values instant gratification. If the results are almost not instantaneous, we tend to lose interest and to give up. We tend to make excuses for why things didn't work out, and we really didn't want the result after all. Our society gives up when the going gets tough. Our worldly society gives, tends to give up on marriages, on career paths, on long-term goals, on hard roads and paths in life. Our society prefers the pleasant, the easy, the free, and the immediate things in life. Our society does not have the stomach for the long-term and difficult path. When those difficulties arise, man tends to give up. Please turn with me to 2 Corinthians 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. The Apostle Paul exhorts the brethren in the Corinthian congregation to never give up. In 2 Corinthians 4, and verse, starting in verse 16, I'm going to read this out of the New Living Translation. 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 16, the Apostle Paul writes, We know that God, God the Father, who raised the Lord Jesus, will also raise us with Jesus and present us to Himself together with you. All of this is for your benefit, and as God's grace reaches more and more people, there will be great thanksgiving, and God, God the Father, will receive more and more glory. Verse 16, that is why we never give up. That is why we never give up. Though our bodies are dying, our spirits are being renewed every day. For our present troubles are small and won't last very long. Yet they produce for us a glory that vastly outweighs them and will last forever. So we don't look at the troubles we can see now. Rather, we fix our gaze on things that cannot be seen. For the things we see now will soon be gone. But the things we cannot see will last forever. Verse 16 in the King James Version states, For which cause we faint not. The Greek verb in verse 16 translated as to faint or to give up is ekakeo, E-K-K-A-K-E-O. It is Strong's 1573, which means to faint, to be weary, to be negatively influenced with the outcome of experiencing inner weakness to be negatively influenced with the outcome of being of experiencing inner weakness uh, inner weariness i think all of us can personally relate to being negatively influenced with the outcome of experiencing inner weariness do we feel at times that we are just at our wits end that we are just tired and weary of pressing forward, that we are bewildered at all the negative circumstances that are happening all around us in our lives. Things that just keep happening again and again, we just feel weary and worn down. Do we ever feel like just giving up? That the way is just too hard. Why is it this hard that we are that what we are facing is not what we signed up for. You know, do we ever say that? You know, th Father, this is not what I signed up for. Do we ever have these thoughts? Please turn with me to 2 Chronicles 15. 2 Chronicles 15. 
Azza was a good king of Judah who obeyed Yehovah and did not serve the other pagan gods in their rituals. Yehovah, through the prophet Az Azariah, encouraged Azza not to give up, not to be weary, and not to lose heart. We'll just read one verse, which is 2 Chronicles 15 and verse 7, and I'll read this in the New International Version. 2 Chronicles 15 and verse 17. But as for you, be strong and do not give up, for your work will be rewarded. Do not give up. Brethren, looking back in our lives, do we see the many times that our Heavenly Father encouraged us to not give up? Not to be weary, not to lose heart. Maybe it was a strange occurrence, a comment from a friend, something that seemingly came out of nowhere, which heartened and strengthened us. Again, the Father is not going to sabotage us. He wants us to win. He wants us to overcome, and He wants us to enter His kingdom. Please turn with me to Galatians 6. Paul is exhorting the Galatian brethren to bear one another's burdens and to persevere in the face of adversity. In Galatians 6, beginning, in, and we'll read verse 9 in the New International Version, Paul writes in Galatians 6 and verse 9, Let us not become weary in well-doing, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. The Greek verb in verse 9 is again ekakeo. The same verb in, as in 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 16, meaning to faint. So let us not become weary, ekakeo, to be faint, to be weary, to be negatively influenced with the outcome of experiencing inner weariness. Does that describe us? Are we in, internally just weary? Please turn with me to 2 Corinthians 11. Paul included in his second epistle to the Corinthian brethren all the trials all the tribulations, all the sufferings that he had endured during his ministry. We read this in 2 Corinthians 11, beginning in verse 23. 2 Corinthians 11, verse 23. Paul wrote, Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more, in labors more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequent, and deaths oft. Of the Jews, five times received I forty stripes, save one. Thrice I was beaten with rods, once I was stoned. Thrice I suffered shipwreck. A night and a day I have been in the deep, in journeyings often, in perils of water, in perils of robbers, in perils by my own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren." in weariness, in painfulness, in watchings or sleeplessness, oft, often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness, beside those things that are without, that which, be, which comes upon me daily, the care of all the churches. Brethren, most of us have never and hopefully will never have to endure what the, the Apostle Paul endured. I don't think any of us have been stoned or whipped or beaten or shipwrecked or hunted down like an animal. Yet Paul never lost faith. He never lost hope. He never lost his zeal for God the Father and for Jesus Christ. And he never, ever, ever gave up. Please turn with me to 2 Timothy verse 4. 2 Timothy, verse 4. At the end of his life in Rome, Paul knew that he was going to be executed in the coming days or weeks. He knew his life was at an end. His last message that he sent to his fellow minister, Timothy, in which, and in that message, he confidently looked back on his lifelong battle and he claimed victory. 
He claimed victory. He never gave up. In 2 Timothy 4 and verse 6, 2 Timothy 4, we'll begin in verse 6. Paul wrote these words, For I am ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all of them also that love his appearing. Just like Paul did in his life, we must commit ourselves to finishing the race. No matter the trials, no matter the obstacles, no matter the problems that we may face, we must never, ever give up. And brethren, never giving up will help us endure until the end. The fifth and final point in helping to endure until the end is point number five, don't look back, move forward. Don't look back, move forward. Brethren, do we find ourselves looking back on what might have been, on what we have lost, on all that we have forfeited in our obedience and in our loyalty to our Heavenly Father and to Jesus Christ? Please turn with me to Luke 9. In responding to some disciples who were giving excuses for not following him, Jesus made a simple but profoundly significant statement. And we read this in Luke 9 and verse 62. Very well-known verse. Luke chapter 9 and verse 62. And Jesus said unto him, No man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God for our Heavenly Father's kingdom. You know, brethren, the entire history of the wanderings of the Israelites for 40 years was that the entire generation which left Egypt always looked back toward Egypt with longing eyes for an Egypt that they had begun to romanticize in their minds and which only existed in their minds and, and imaginations. It wasn't a true Egypt. That generation of Israel did not look ahead to the promised land, which was never real to them to begin with, and which they never truly valued. Is the kingdom of God real to you? Is it real to us? And brethren, are we looking back or are we moving forward? Please turn with me to Philippians 3. Paul exhorted the Philippians to reach forward, to the goals that lay before us. Philippians 3 and verse 13. Paul writes, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. Do we do that? Do we do that? Do we look forward always toward the kingdom Forgetting the things that have happened to us, the hurts, the, 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 the terrible things that have happened in our past. Do we forget those, keep our eyes on the goal, and move forward to the kingdom? There's a famous quote by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. that he gave in, ninth, in April of 1960 in an address to the students at Spelman College in Atlanta, Georgia in which he stated, If you can't fly, then run. If you can't run, then walk. If you can't walk, then crawl. But whatever you do, you have to keep moving forward. Brethren, do we move forward? No matter what way, shape, or form, do we continue to move forward? So brethren, we cannot look back. We cannot focus on what we've given up to live this way of life in order to be obedient to our Heavenly Father. We cannot devote our energies in romanticizing the life we had in the past or what we could have had now without the Father's calling. 
We cannot allow ourselves to feel defeated. Satan wants that. Satan desires that for us. He wants our defeat. He wants us to completely and utterly fail. Satan wants us to fall short to where we do not enter our Heavenly Father's kingdom that God the Father and Jesus Christ want to give to us so earnestly. We must keep moving forward toward the kingdom and never look back. So, brother, not looking back, but always moving forward will help us endure unto the end. Brethren, we have discussed five ways to help us endure unto the end. They are, point one, do not be fearful. Point two, be confident. Point three, be steadfast. Point four, do not become weary and give up. Point five, don't look back, move forward. For a final scripture, brethren, please turn with me again to Mark 13, where we started in the sermon. Again, Jesus was warning his disciples that they would all be hated by the whole world because of his name and that they would all have to endure. In Mark 13, 13, we read again, Christ said, And you shall be hated of all men for my name's sake, but he that endures unto the end, the same shall be saved. There's a, par a parallel account is also given in Matthew 24, verse 13, which uses the exact same words. The verb hupomeno in this verse in Greek is actually in the aorist participle form, which in English should be translated as having endured which is the perfective form of the verb in English, just like it is in, e in Greek. This form represents a point in time referring back to a completed action in the past. The Biblios Interlinear Bible translates this verse as, And you will be hated by all on my account of my name. However, the one having endured unto the end, he will be saved. Matthew uses the exact same verb in the exact same verb form, the aorist participle form, as Mark used in his account. Again, this form puts the time frame of the verse in the future with the endurance as being a completed action. We use this verb form often in English in the, as the perfect participle. The perfect participle indicates that you have completed the past action and can carry out the second action. So in the sentence, having performed his required work, he left the office. What is automatically implied in the sentence in English is that the man completed his required work, and then he was able to leave the office. From the time frame of the sentence, we are looking back on a completed action. The same is true for Mark 13, 13, and Matthew 24, 13. There's a slightly different connotation in the Greek text than the King James text because the Greek text shows the endurance as a completed action. This verse implies victory and that we did indeed endure to the end. So Mark 13, 13 in the Greek text is a confident, victorious, inspiring, and motivating statement by Jesus for his disciples. And those disciples include us today. Brethren, we have so much to be thankful for. Our Heavenly Father has opened our eyes to understand more and more and more about Him. We have a special insight to the Bible that we did not have before. The Bible has truly come alive to us like it never had before. Still, we are faced with adversities. Many of us are facing severe trials. Many of us are alone. Many of us have been abandoned by friends or by families. Some of us, many of us, are facing life-threatening trials. Brethren, no matter what the trial or obstacle or problem or debacle or weakness or sin or shortcoming that we are facing, 
with the love and the help and the power of our Heavenly Father, we can endure unto the end. Tomorrow we will, be, we will assemble again together to celebrate and observe the Feast of Pentecost, a day which pictures the end of our journey, the first resurrection, our entry into God the Father's kingdom, and as His spiritual children with spiritual and eternal bodies. What a wonderful time that represents. Brethren, let's renew our commitment to our Heavenly Father that we are, we are in this for the long haul. That we will honor His calling of us by not being fearful, but by being confident, by being steadfast, by never giving up, by always moving toward Him and toward His kingdom, and by enduring unto the end. And brethren, we will endure unto the end. Brethren, happy Pentecost to you all. May, our, may all of our actions, thoughts, and speech give glory and honor to our Heavenly Father. And may His kingdom come soon. Okay, brethren, for the last song, if you'd please take your hymnals, we'll turn over to page 14. Page 14. And after this, we'll be led in closing prayer by Alan Hurst. Closing prayer, Alan. Father in heaven, we pause now at the end of this service, thanking you so much for the message that we've heard. We ask that you'd continue to uh, bless us of, as over this coming week, and we ask uh, also that you would uh, please bless and be with those families of, of those that are sick, and we ask that. Uh, you would continue to bless them and to bring us back here next week. And this we ask and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.